Amen. Thank you very much. Um, it's good to be back. I feel like I haven't preached in a while because I haven't. So it's good to be up here to see all your guys' faces. Last month was a lot of fun. My wife and I were able to move in uh, to our house. And thank you, everyone who helped us out um, in all the ways that you guys have been awesome. Uh, we feel so supported by our church family, and I just want to thank you all for that. Um, we are going through a series today. And don't worry, I'm, I know right now what you guys are thinking of the marinades and of the, the hamburgers and the brats that are like in your fridge right now, ready to be grilled up this afternoon. I won't take that long, okay? I got a marinade going as well, so um, I don't, <laughs> I will, we'll be quick here, but also I think this is such a vital uh, topic and in, que- and in question to answer today. We've been going through this series uh, called Questions and Answers, and we talked about what does, you know, why does God allow suffering? Why, why does God allow suffering in this world? Tim talked about that three weeks ago. And if you have that question, which most Christians or people in this world have that question, why does God allow suffering sometimes? If you have that question, I encourage you, if you haven't seen that, watch that sermon, go back to our YouTube and uh, watch that sermon and, and um, it can give you some clarity and, and maybe some answers. And then uh, Zach talked about how to recover from failure. How do we recuperate from failure when, when inevitably we will fail? And then last week, Pastor Terry talked about um, managing stress. Stress is inevitable in our life. And how do we manage that stress? How do we take it and control it so that it doesn't control us? Well, today we're going to talk about a question. And I think it's a very good question. It's a little obscure. When I first uh, read this this week, I was like, man, what can I change this question to? Because I really don't, uh, don't really think this question is like a zinger. It's not like, oh, man, that's... That's one that's been eating at me forever. I really want the answer to that question. It's how to, how to live life. How do I live life above average? How do I live life above average? And I thought it wasn't that pertinent of a question until I started researching it more and reading about it more and really developing this thought in my mind that we are called, if you are a Christ follower, If you're a human being made in the image of God, you are called to live a life above average. It's a calling for every single person on this planet. And I think it's incredibly pertinent. It's incredibly pertinent to who we are, our identity. We are called to be above average. Well, I think when we talk about like above average, what does that even mean? You know, I think we need to set a baseline for what is average? What is an average life? What does that look like? Well, the average, so I did some statistics studying because that's always fun and kind of depressing. Um, the average marriage, looked at how long does the average marriage last? The average marriage lasts eight years. The average marriage lasts eight years and the average person is divorced by 30. The average household income in Milwaukee County is 50,000, for those of you who knew that. The average American will live 78 and a half years old. The average American has $90,000 in debt. 35% of America, 35% of America attend a religious service regularly. So that means 35% including every single religion there is, 35% is including all of that, attend a religious sermon regularly. That means 65% of the nation has no religion at all. That's average in America. 5% of people are virgins on their wedding day. 5%. That means it is average to lose your virginity by 17. To get married after having multiple partners, that's average, that's normal. Average time on social media, ooh, you guys ready for this one? Two hours and 25 minutes a day on social media. That's the average time. And I know some of you guys are like, wow, that's pretty low if you look at my screen time. (laughs) The average uh, TV watching per day, which is on top of social media, is four hours a day. Let me put that in a little bit of perspective. That's 28 hours a week. It's more than a part-time job. That's two full months of the year, two entire months of the year, the average American spends watching television. And so if we took that average um, lifespan of 78 years and two months every year, 
it goes to 13 years of your life will be spent by the average person watching television. That is, <laughs> that is average. And so when we ask this question, how do we live above average? That's the bar that's been set for us. Another word for average could be this, normal. How do we live an above normal life? See, normal is actually defined as the usual, average, or typical state or condition. That's the definition of normal. And in our society, normal is completely different than what God has called us to be. What God has called you to be. If you are created in the image of God, you are created to live a life that is full. That is not average. That's not normal. We are called to be, the Bible says, a peculiar people. We're different. We're, we're abnormal. And if, if I look back at my life, I remember growing up, I was a weird kid, so um, that kind of explains this story a little bit. But in, in high school, um, I, uh, I had a, a youth pastor and, and he, or a speaker. Someone came through, and they were talking to us, and they asked us this one question. And I hadn't really thought about it too much in, as a serious like meditation thought. But they asked this question, what do you fear in life? And I remember that question really well because one of the kids was like being smart or I don't know, maybe he was serious, but he yells out, sharks! And we lived in the middle of the desert. And I was like, what? <laughs> Why you, okay, you're afraid of sharks in the desert. Um, but I remember that. And, and I remember that question, what are you afraid of the most in life? And, and I took that question and I went home and I thought about it and kind of meditated on it. I was like, what do I fear the most of everything else? And I remember as a as a high schooler coming up with the conclusion that I feared the most was living a mediocre life. Living a life where I was average. Living a life where I was reserved to take the path of least resistance. The, what was least expected of me. That I would just go through life with no ambition, no direction. That was my greatest fear. And it drove me it drove me to make a lot of decisions that put me in the position where I am today. I wanted to live a life that was so far above average. So how do we get there? Because we're not called to be normal. You're not called to be average. It's certainly not the standard of the average that we see in our society today. So how do we get above average? How do we live that life? And we're going to look at an example today in First Chronicles chapter 4, verse 9. First Chronicles, if you hear Chronicles, you pro probably already think, um, if, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, Chronicles is really like a list of genealogies. It's a history book. And, and in, in chapter 4, there's reading the genealogies of, of Judah and the history of Judah. And, and it kind of goes name after name, and then it talks about one guy, and he only gets two verses. He gets two verses here, and I think from these two verses we can learn a lot about what it means to live a life above average. The guy's name is Jabez. That's a cool name, huh? I knew one Jabez in college, Zach and Kaylee. Jabez, it's a cool name. Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. His mother named him Jabez, saying, I gave birth to him in pain. <laughs> I think we all should be called Jabez if that's the condition. I gave birth to him in pain. Jabez cried out to the God of Israel, Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory. Let your hand be with me. Keep me from harm so that I will be free from pain. And the last part here, and God granted his request. Jabez was a man of great ambition, who wanted to live above average. So let's pray real quick. God, thank you for your word. Thank you that you have given us a guidebook to go through life so that we don't have to be reserved to live an average life, but you have called us to live above average. And I pray that you will open up our own hearts today, that you will reveal to us what keeps us from living a life above average that you will inspire us, that you'll give us a zeal to live a life pursuing you and the dream that you have given us and that you have for our lives. We pray this in your name. Amen. So number one, what can we learn from Jabez? Jabez had 
great ambitions. Jabez had great ambitions. He dreamed big, and he wasn't afraid to dream big. There's a, there's a quote, if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. So many of people just go through life with no vision, no goal, nothing to shoot towards. And so instead, they're just kind of going with the, the path of least resistance, just going through life, wandering around, hoping that it turns out good, but there is no direction. There's no dream. Jabez had a dream. He had a great ambition. And God gives us a life, and he wants us to live that life that he has given you to, to the fullest. He wants you to live it abundantly. In John 10.10, 10, the Bible says, The thief comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I come that they might have life and have it to the full. Jesus came to this earth so that you could live a full life, so that I could live a full life. And Jabez understood this. So what causes us then? If that's, if that's God's desire for us is to live this full, abundant, awesome above average life, what causes us not to do that? What holds us back? I think most of us would desire that. What holds us back? Number one, we confuse humility with fear. Confuse humility with fear, and this is where I got stuck on. I was afraid, and, uh, and it caused me to not realize my full potential of what God had given me in life, and I don't want to it's, it's kind of the person that says this. I don't want to be a big name, I'm, or, or this one. I want to be the behind-the-scenes person. I want, I'm just the behind-the-scenes person. You know, I don't want all the recognition. Whatever excuse you give, and, and that was me. I was like, I'm the behind-the-scenes person. I'm not the guy, you know, to get up front and talk. I'm, and, that was, and that's okay. I, don't misunderstand me. There are people who are behind-the-scenes person, and you guys are awesome at it, and that is your calling, and you're doing it, and it's great. But the reason, the motive I was doing it, is because I was afraid. I said, well, I'll just be the behind the scenes person. I'll serve God that way. And God had a bigger calling for my life that I knew, and I was afraid to accept that calling, and so I accepted it, and I, I confused humility with fear. So my, my thinking of, well, I'll just, I'll just be the guy, you know, that, that no one really notices or whatever, but I was afraid to, to truly step into what God was calling me to do. See, 2 Timothy 1, 7 says this, it says, for God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and of love and of self-control. And so if a spirit of fear is holding you back from realizing the dream that God has given you, the ambition that you have, and there's some sort of fear, the fear of failure, the fear of being up front, the fear of not measuring up, whatever fear is holding you back, that it fear is not given to you by God. That fear is from Satan. He wants to defeat you with your fear the fear of conflict, the fear of resolution, whatever it is, the fear that is involved in your path right now that you, that you say, I want to do that, but, and you list whatever it is, that fear. Don't confuse that fear with humility because fear kills ambition. There are over 365 instances in the Bible, maybe you've heard this before, where the Bible commands us a simple command, don't be afraid. Don't be anxious. Don't worry. Over 365 times, that's, I mean, if you guessed it already, that's enough for one per day. God knew that we were going to struggle with fear. He knew that it was a battle that we were going to face over and over again. Joshua in Joshua 1, who, who's going to take the nation of Israel, and he's going to have to conquer all these lands and these people who were giants in front of him. And God says, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Only be courageous. Because he had a huge ambition, a huge dream in front of him, and it took courage to overcome his fear. Don't be afraid. Whatever God is calling you to do, it's specific for your life. Don't let fear kill your ambition. Number two, why, why what holds us back? It's fear. We confuse humility with fear. And, and number two, we confuse contentment with complacency. We confuse contentment with complacency. We we say, well, this is where I am, and so I'm content to stay here. This is where I am, and so this is where God has called me to be, so I'm just going to sit here and stay, and you know, I don't really have to change because I'm content exactly where I'm at. And being content with where you are doesn't mean that you don't have a goal or a plan. It doesn't mean that you don't have a direction. It's true, we are supposed to be content with whatever place God has put us in. 
but that doesn't mean we have to be content to stay there. And I believe as a church, I'm content with Faith Bible Church, and I'm content that God has brought me here. But I have a vision and a goal, and, and me and Zach and Pastor Terry and Tim, and we wanna, we wanna grow this church, we wanna grow our influence in this community. I'm content with that, but that doesn't mean that we, we don't wanna expand our borders. As Jabez prayed, expand our territory. God, grow our influence. Give us the vision to see the people in our neighborhood. Zach and I have been uh, going door to door just to people in this neighborhood. On on a street right down the road or just right down the road, and people don't even know our church is here. And I want to, I'm not content to stay there. I want to have an ambition and a dream as a church to teach this community that there's a church here that loves them. There's a church here that has the truth of the gospel and wants to give it to them and wants to see their life grow and wants them to live an above average life. That's where we want to be. That's above average. That's our dream. Don't confuse contentment with complacency. Be content with where you're at, but don't be content to stay there. Grow. Thirdly, what holds us back from being ambitious is we confuse small thinking with spirituality. We confuse small thinking with spirituality. We say things like, this is just the way God made me. Well, that's just the way God gave me, made me. He only gave me a certain amount of talents. That's just the way he made me. Or you say things like this, I serve in the little areas. I serve, you know, that's, that's my uh, contribution to the ambition that, that God has given me. I serve in the little areas. And this might sting a little bit, but I want you to know I love you. That's why I'm saying this, because I hope that this speaks to someone in this room. But don't blame God for your lack of growth. Don't be guilty of blaming God for your lack of growth. Because he wants you to grow. He doesn't want you to stay a little tree forever. He wants you to grow, to strengthen, to mature, and to produce fruit. Don't blame God for your lack of growth. Because small thinking, fear, complacency, those are things that kill dreams that God has given us. Don't be afraid to dream big. Be a church, be a family, be a person at your work that has an ambition that is God-given and God-driven. Be above average. So number one, what did Jabez have? Well, Jabez had a great ambition. I wanna see my borders expanded. What else did Jabez have? Number two, Jabez had a growing faith. Jabez had a growing faith. William Carey is famous uh, for saying this. He's a famous missionary, pioneer missionary. And he's famous for this line. He said, attempt great things for God and expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God and expect great things from God. Work your hardest and pray your hardest that God will show up and that he will move. That's what Jabez did. He had this big vision, this big goal, but he had faith that God would help him achieve that goal. Romans 14, 23 says, for whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Whatever we do in life, if you go to work, if you breathe, whatever you're going to do, every action, if it doesn't stem from faith, it's sin. So are you living a life above average or the only other alternative, a faithless life is a life of sin, a life against God? Living a life of faith is where God wants us to be, reliant on him to provide for us. Jabez understood this. See, Jabez was a common man with uncommon faith. He was just an average Joe, just a guy in the list of the genealogies that had an uncommon faith that God could do what he said he could do. And Faith is more important than talent and abilities. It's more important than what you think you can do on your own. That's what faith is. It's doing above what you think you can do on your own. It's doing and working the dream that you have, God has given you, trusting that God will help you fulfill that, that dream, that ambition. I've heard it said this way, God doesn't call the gifted, he gifts the called. God doesn't call the gifted. He's not, you're not, if you're sitting there waiting, man, I just, 
I, got, I want to do this huge thing. I want to, whatever it is. Maybe it's not huge, but I just want, I have this dream for my life, and I'm just waiting because I'm not gifted in that area. I'm just waiting. Uh, I'm waiting for God to do something, show me a sign, whatever. God doesn't call the gifted. He gifts the called. Where he, where he calls you, he will enable you to do that. I'm walking testimony of that. I suffered from panic attacks that would enable me to speak in front of people. Whenever I would get in front of a public crowd, it didn't matter how many people, if it was 100 people or if it was five people. If I had to speak in front of people, I would have a panic attack that wouldn't allow me to speak. I had the inability to. But I knew that God was calling me to do something greater with my life. And he showed me that his calling, that if I put my faith in him, he would provide for me. And whatever God is calling you to do, obviously he's not going to call everyone to be a pastor. But whatever he is calling you to do specifically, he will provide for you. He will enable you. He will be there. And we can put our faith, we can take that to the bank. And Jabez knew that. Jabez was like, I know I have a God who I can rely on, who I can put my faith in. He was a common man with uncommon faith. Also, Jabez was thought to have some type of disability. Hence the name Jabez. His name means painful in Hebrew. And so there's an understanding here that he had some kind of birth defect that inhibited him in birth and, and throughout his life. And Jabez, despite this handicap, didn't allow it to defeat what God had called him to do. And that's a simple question. What handicap do you feel like you can't do something because of this? I have an ambition, but I can't do it because I'm not physically able to or because I'm not uh, spiritually able to, or maybe there's a past hurt. Maybe you have a, a broken marriage, a sinful addiction. There's something there that's handicapping you that's saying, you can't do this. And God is saying, you can. You can do this. He wants us to put our faith and trust in him like Jabez did. Mark 9, 23 says this, and Jesus, and Jesus is about to heal a little boy who is presumed dead and Everything is possible is what Jesus says for those who believe. And immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, help my unbelief. Everything is possible for those who believe. And if you're sitting here today, I, I believe that. And this man whose, whose boy was dead and Jesus was going to bring him back to life, said, I believe that, help my unbelief. Jabez believed that God could do amazing things. He had a growing faith. So Jabez had this great vision. He had a growing faith. And lastly, Jabez had a genuine prayer life. He had a genuine prayer. And that's really what this verse is. Verse 10, he's Jabez praying to God, asking God for this huge, ambitious vision. So number one, Jabez prayed for God's power in his life. He prayed for God to move in his life. And it's important that Jabez was specific in the prayer that he prayed. He wasn't ambiguous. He said, this is the vision that God has given me. I'm going to pray directly for this vision. I'm going to pray, God, give me the power to do what you have called me to do. And when we talk about ambition, I know that can almost be like a cuss word in Christian circles because ambition can, can a lot of times uh, coincide with pride. People are like, well, if someone has ambition, they're, they're prideful or they're greedy or whatever it is. And ambition in and of itself is not bad. It is a drive. Ambition is a zeal. It is a, is a, a drive to do something. Ambition is amoral. So what makes it bad? I think the morality of ambition is predicated by one word. Anybody know what that word is? Motive. The morality of our ambition is predicated by our motive. And we know that Jabez's motive to expand his ter territories to do something great was pure. And we know it was pure. We know it was a right motive because God honored it. Because when we read at the end, God answered his request. And in James 4, James says this. He says, you desire and do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask. And when you ask, you do not receive. Because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. James is saying, if you ask with the wrong motives, you're not going to get what you want from God. And God honored Jabez's prayer. 
So we can tell from that that, that Jabez's motive was pure. He had a motive to glorify God. What is our motive for our ambition? And that's huge. That is huge. Because we can have ambition in life all motivated by the bottom dollar. I have this huge vision in life, and and it's all motivated by what I can make from it in the end. Or this huge vision of, I want to do this because I want to be this. I want to be somebody. I want to be a name. Or I want to be recognized by somebody. All those motives that are selfish, self-glorifying motives are wrong. And Jesus is saying here, don't uh, he, or James was saying that ambition with the wrong motive will not be answered by God. Those prayers are not going to be answered by God. He's saying have an ambition that is pure. Have an ambition that is driven to glorify God. Live a life that is glorifying God. That is above average. The above average life is a life that is lived in ambition to glorify God with everything we do. And God wants us to ask for big things. But sometimes we think the big things are too big for God. Anybody guilty of that? Thinking of something and you're like, man, that prayer, I'm, I've been there. Because maybe the realist in, uh, in me comes out and I'm just like, man, that's a, big, that's a big ask. That is a huge prayer request to God. And, and, and we like, we'll pray it and we think kind of like this. We're like, oh, I'll pray it, yeah. But uh, it'll never happen. And we'll be like, okay, God, this is the prayer. I pray that you will change this nation. I pray that you will bring a revival I pray this prayer, and in your heart, you're like, man, is that, is that even possible? Can God do that? Pray big prayers and have the faith that God can answer prayers because God can answer big prayers. Do you believe that? God can answer big prayers. Our God is a big God. And in Jeremiah 33, he says, Call to me, and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things that you don't know. Ephesians 3.20 says this, Now to him who is able, talking about God, to do immeasurably more than we can ask or even imagine according to his power that is at work within us. God can go so far beyond what we can imagine, so far beyond what we think is big and we think is too much for God. He can go beyond what we can even imagine. And we can pray, God, expand uh, our territory of our church, expand my ministry at my work, expand my influence for you. And God can go, I can go so much more than that. Give it to me. I can handle it. I got big shoulders. I can move. Jabez took advantage of that. He had a faith in God that he could move and expand his territories and grow and achieve his ambition through Jesus, through God. And that's the only way, through the power of God, that we can achieve the ambition that glorifies God. We can't do it by ourselves. We cannot do it by ourselves. We can try. And a lot of people do. They try really hard. And they end up frustrated. They end up defeated. They end up saying it's not worth it. Maybe, maybe this wasn't even the right thing to do in the first place. Because they try with our own power. But God is there to give you the strength and the power that you need to accomplish the goals that he has set before us. You believe that? I believe that. I believe that if God has given us a vision, he will equip you to accomplish that vision. I believe God has huge plans for this church. I believe God can use this church to move this neighborhood. I believe there are people in the future right now that are waiting for us, waiting for you to share God's glory, to share God's goodness, to share the goodness of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, the hope of salvation. There are people right now in Milwaukee County that are waiting for you to share that with them. And I believe God can use his people to expand his territory. But what's holding us back? Why do we resolve sometimes to live average when God has called us to live above average? So Jabez prayed for God's presence. He prayed for God's power. And lastly, he prayed for God's protection. 1 Corinthians 4.10, Jabez says, Keep me from harm so that I will be free from pain. See, Jabez knew that with larger territories, especially back in that day, with larger territories, with a bigger name meant one thing. It meant you were a bigger target. 
that people were going to come after you even the more. That was thousands of years ago, and honestly, not much has changed. Sound familiar, right? If you have a big ambi- uh, ambition, if you have a big dream for God, if you have a desire to do something more than you think you're able to do, what are you going to be met with? Critics. The, the more and the bigger ambition you have, the more critics you're going to face. The more naysayers you're going to face, the more people that will attack you, the more that Satan will look at you as a bigger target. And so he prays for God's protection. I pray for God's protection on my life. I pray for God's protection on this church. I pray for God's, God's protection on you. That as we live a life to be more ambitious and to push forward to be more than what we are, more than, than average and normal, that God will protect us along the way. And there's a, a, a quote that I've quoted here before, but I love it. It says, if you fear criticism, say nothing, do nothing, and be nothing. If you fear criticism in life, then say nothing, do nothing, and be nothing. And that's not who we're called to be. We are called to say something. We are called to do something, and we are called to be something. You are called to be something. Be something more than average and above average. So let's follow Jabez's Jabez's outline right here. Jabez, he had that great vision. He believed and he had faith that God could fulfill that vision. And he prayed that God would be with him as he did. And when I think of that, I think of a few stories of people. And today we're going to watch one of those stories. We're going to watch a story of someone who's very familiar to you and uh, very familiar to me and and a familiar face around here. And it's a story of someone who um, lived an average life who experienced that, and then experienced the above average life of living a life glorifying God and the blessings that came from it. So let's watch this video real quick. Hey everyone, I'm Nate Angles. Um, A lot of you might know me. I've grown up in the church and been here my whole life. Um, I want to talk today about kind of an average life versus a above average life, and hopefully I can impact some people and in a positive way. So an average life to me is really just living in the world, um, just doing what everyone else is doing because that's pretty much what average is, you know, um, not not really following godly principles or Christ Christ, uh, principles and more drinking, partying, uh, swearing, you know, all all the things that we're taught not to do, you know, in the church or when we grow up and just, you know, following what the world does. So for me, I grew up in the church, um, kind of sheltered, if you will, um, and a lot of a lot of my early childhood, you know, I, I was kind of that goody two shoes, right? I followed the rules, did all that. And when I got to uh, high school, is when I started getting into the wrong, uh, I guess, groups of people, right? So football, wrestling, all these sports teams, everyone started experimenting with drinking or. Um, you know, smoking or whatever, and I kind of got caught up in that, and then that led into college even more so. I went to Whitewater and was on the football team, so there's a lot of drinking going on, partying, you know, getting into the wrong things, and um, so a lot of my probably 18 to 22-ish, I was really doing the wrong things and still going to church and kind of like living that two two story life, right, where on Sundays, I was like a good Christian boy, but then, or a good Christian guy, and then on uh, during the week, I was not. So, um, I think for me, when I decided to live above average, um, well, number there's a there's a few catalysts in my life. So, number one, um, I got a DUI. So, I you know drinking, driving, I had done it a lot of times, and a lot of people did, right? It was average, but I got caught, and that really changed how I thought of things. I stopped drinking for a long time. I went to celebrate recovery um, and that really helped me. My parents were there for me and um, they didn't they didn't disown me or anything like that. They loved me through it and they really helped me um, just realize how it was hurting myself and hurting my family and caused a lot of heartache for them. Uh, and then when I met my wife now, um, I kind of also had that catalyst with her and you know, I just wanted to be a good leader for her, um, a good influence on her, and then also when we had kids. So that was a, that was like probably the biggest catalyst. Is I now have people that I need to raise, and I want to raise them with Christian values to to follow Christ. And if I'm not living that way, then how can I teach someone to live that way? So I've I feel like I've 
received a lot of blessings um, even before but more so after I started living an above average life um, obviously I had a lot of uh, consequences like the DUI and, and other heartache uh, things with my family and my wife and just just going through a lot of that was was hard before I lived uh, above average and you know once I started living above average we've been blessed with three beautiful children we've been blessed financially um, we have a great family uh, I just feel like life it, it not it's not all easy but ever since really refocusing on on God like even even just financially recently you know we we, we had a, a Bible study about finances and it really got us, my wife and I, thinking like, hey, we should be more diligent in our giving um, and just, you know, in our trusting of God. And even since we've been doing that, like, we've been blessed beyond belief. Every month we seem to make more money and like, you know, it's, we just give it back, you know, to the church or to people who, who need it. And, you know, we're just, we're just super blessed. So. so if I had to compare my past life to my current above average life, I would say it's, I wouldn't even recognize myself from back then i think that every single area is better it's um i you know you're i'm blessed beyond belief and, and i would encourage you to like start living above average because you will not even understand you, you have no idea how good things can get when you start to live for god live above average i think that's where you have an awesome testimony of nate I'm going to ask the worship team to come up as we close. But I think that as we look at that, at that example, someone who has lived average and now lives above average, I hope it inspires you. I hope it gives you hope that that is what God has called us to be. John 10.10, 10, take that verse with you today. That God has come, Jesus came, so that they may have life and that we can have life to the full. It's been said that there's two, uh, the, there's two great days in your life. The day you were born and the day that you find out why. Why was I born? And I think that's the above average person is someone who has discovered that dream, that ambition, that direction that God has given you. Why am I here? And has held on to it and runs with it and doesn't allow fear doesn't allow all those things to derail our vision for what God has done for us and what God wants us to do. See, an above average life is a journey. It's not a destination. It's not something that you arrive at. It's something we do every single day. And as we walk this journey, we must remember that God, that we need God, like Jabez. God needs to be with us. We need God. And like Jabez, who put his faith completely in God, we need Jesus to walk with us. So we're going to sing this song. It's called, Lord, Lord, I Need You. And as we sing this song, Lord, I Need You, I hope it reminds us that we need to put our faith in Jesus, that we can't do this on our own. That if you are desiring to live an above average life, it's a life that's going to require a relationship with Jesus. So let's all sing this together.